give our students as opposed to sign the agenda sheet on their consideration. And, excuse me, in regards to the announcement you made a second ago about Joseph Stiglitz, um, my capstone teacher uh, has a special deal which you can get, um, I believe, students in for about $25, as long as they're in groups of 10. And I think that's still cheaper than the student grade on that website. And if anybody's interested in that, speak to me after class or after the seminar. Great. And maybe get 10 people to get that deal with that. Good. Thank you. That take care of us. Very good. Okay, today we're very fortunate to have with us, with us Josh Eisenman from the Economics Department at UC Santa Cruz. He has a distinguished career in international economics. He's speaking today on emerging markets, international reserves, and the global crisis, which combines some different strands of work he's done in a few different papers. He's also a co-author of with our own Professor Hiro Ito. So I'll leave it at that. You can give them any other background context you think is appropriate. Thank oh, you very much. I'm sorry. One further thing, Professor Eisenman is a pro, so I'm going to leave you in his hands. He is happy to entertain questions as they arise, and he'll deal with them as they should be. Thank you. I'm delighted. I feel that even the weather here seems to be California type, so I'm delivering and coordinating it. Now, uh, this is a topic, a topic that deals with some technical aspects of emerging markets, and I would prefer to answer questions as they come, and feel free to ask anything related to this topic, which is really broad, and I'll do my best not to get too technical, but it's up to you. If you wish, I'll be happy to deal with more technical aspects. So the, the topic deals with the hoarding and using international liquidity, what is called international reserves, in emerging markets. And if you are not interested, and if you are not focusing, say, on emerging markets, it may be a boring topic, but as you should be aware, these emerging markets seem to buy half to two-thirds of the U.S. government debt that was issued in the happy years that led to the present crisis. So one can think about this topic either in the context of the interaction between emerging markets and the U.S., or what I focus mostly today from the perspective of emerging markets. So I'm not going to discuss today the topic dealing with the close interaction between, say, China and the U.S. in the context of global imbalances, which is related to some of these reserves. But I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have if they will lead also to this type of a discussion. So again, I, there is no reason for me to finish all the 44 transparencies. It will be up to you to decide the pace. So let me point out that the overview is I'd like to start by reviewing the hoarding of reserves before the crisis to set, to define the interesting questions that one may ask about the crisis. I uh, then overview the recent experience of Korea, Brazil, and a bunch of other markets, and I argue that before the crisis, some of their behavior was characterized by the fear of floating, and I'll explain this more precisely shortly. During the crisis, at least half of the emerging markets seem to exhibit the fear of using and losing reserves, which is a, not an easy observation to make in the sense that it surprised most of us. And I'll explain what may be the explanation for this. And then I'll argue that one of the lessons of the crisis is that more and more countries may adapt the policies that we have seen before the crisis by India and China. Brazil joined more recently this type of policy, i.e. trying to restrict the inflow of capital, a policy that seemed to work against what used to be called the old Washington consensus. And I'll try to explain what is the logic behind this debate and I believe the reason why emerging markets are revisiting these topics. And then uh, I'll conclude. So if you're asking 
Why should you care about reserves? I would like to review quickly recent episodes. The casebook case of how to use reserves is really the history, recent history of Chile and the management of liquidity in Chile. The textbook of how to abuse reserves to a degree is Argentina and Venezuela recently. And then I focus on the big picture of the trends of liquidity in the 25 years prior to the crisis. And then I focus uh, on the crisis reviewing selectively various emerging markets. So let me point out that uh, Chile is a fascinating country and to a degree it's almost the best performing country in Latin America before the crisis. Now Bra uh, Brazil is joining Chile. And uh, what is interesting about uh, Chile is that uh, here we have uh, a reference to a report going back something like eight months ago, reporting that uh, there was almost a riot in uh, Santiago in the context of uh, an opposition to <coughs> the finance minister, Mr. Velasco, and it turned out that the same minister shortly after became the most popular minister in the government, and all that he took is to notice that the crisis validated the policies of Andres Velasco. So uh, let me explain uh, the challenges of Chile, and here we'll see also the, the political issues that are involved with managing properly reserves. Now, Chile is a country that exporting, is exporting a lot of copper, roughly 40 to 50% of its export revenue is driven by copper. Now, copper is a good commodity, is highly the price of copper is highly volatile. So what you see here is the history of the price of copper in the last five years. Now, it's hard to read it, but the scale is such that this is one, two, and the like. And if you, if you are looking at the volatility, Prices of copper quadrupled in dollar terms in a horizon of four years, and then they collapsed rapidly due to the crisis. Now, this is not uh, really something new. Cycles in the prices of uh, commodities is really the history of Latin America, and Chile is among the countries that is exposed the most to this volatility. Uh, the point of uh, Andres is that he followed the policy that attempted to recognize the cycle of commodities by trying to encourage hoarding <coughs> part of the significant part of the revenue generated by exporting copper in good years, keeping this revenue in order to use it in bad years. Now, uh, before the crisis, uh, the complaint was that this fellow is robbing the wealth of Chile, putting it in fan fancy accounts overseas, and the first item here refers to this opposition. Of course, when the collapse of the price of copper came due to the beginning of the global liquidity crisis, this was the stage where the close to 50 billion dollar of liquidity that was accumulated during that period allowed Chile to follow, if you wish, a counter fiscal policy, counter cycle policy by increasing social expenditure and fiscal expenditure. And this implied that the performance of Chile throughout the crisis was remarkable in comparison to the performance of, say, its neighbor across the Andes, Argentina, and I'll discuss it shortly. Now, uh, in the words of Andres Velasco, which, by the way, was a professor at the Kennedy School before joining the government in Chile, and uh, he was educated in Columbia uh, University, and uh, his policy is summarized uh, in uh, the statement that commodity-driven swings of boom and burst have defined Latin America history for 100 years, and 
that is a cycle that needed to be ended. You say in times of abundance and you invest in many times. And this is precisely what he delivered. He was lucky enough that the crisis came before the end of his tenure that ended with the latest election <laughs> in Chile. So maybe he will, be, uh, he will return to Harvard, though uh, I'm doubtful. Yeah. After tasting that, for the, the joy of being a minister in Chile, I think that he may stay there. So this is really part of the challenge of proper management of resources. Now you can see that there is a lot of uh, opposition partially related to the possibility that if the governor of the central bank or the minister is telling you that they are hoarding money overseas, if there is credibility gap, so then of course you are saying, gee, that's a nice story, but uh, show me the money. So this is an example where this policy seems to work well. The counterexample, and again, if you disagree, this lady is Christina Kirchner, which is really the president that followed the previous Kirchner, and she is now the president of Argentina, and here the latest uh, observation is that in January, she decided to, fu <coughs> to fire the central bank chief, which is a, a person that plays the same role as Mr. Bernanke in the US, and the dispute started by his unwillingness to hand her about $7 billion of reserves. Her claim was to sell this Argentina debt. Let me skip all the details because it's beyond what is the focus of the analysis. But in the case of Argentina, arguably, people are afraid that she's following the old policy of the Peronist party, and critics fear that it would be used the money that she asked the central bank to donate, this was the first installment of seven billion to be followed by another seven billion delight, would be used as a political war chest and leave the country weakened in the face of its economic problems. So here we have a clash between a reasonably strong president with a reasonably assertive governor of the Argentinian Central Bank. And uh, it turned out that this uh, situation is not over because it turned, apparently the constitution of Argentina implies that only the Congress can fire the governor and the Congress is unhappy with the Kirchners. So it's uh, a nice uh, episode in the history of Argentina that will be resolved shortly. But meanwhile, if you are looking at another example, this is Mr. Chavez. And he had the good taste of uh, practically confiscating uh, half of the reserves of the central bank. And this policy is summarized here. It started in uh, 2005 in earnest. And uh, he channeled these resources to a development fund that uh, seemed to help both developing some of the rural areas of uh, Venezuela, but in addition to play his uh, agenda beyond uh, Venezuela, but the bottom line, because of the crisis, uh, the country is facing now a much lower revenue from oil, and for Venezuela, oil is the same as copper for Chile, but this time, because his policy went in the opposite direction versus the Chilean policy propagated by Andres Velasco, he was forced to devalue and here you have the comment of a bureaucrat from the central bank. They are afraid that they don't have enough dollars to back the new exchange rate. Okay? So this is Latin America, and as you can see, please. Yeah. Shouldn't we be disentangling the uh, international revenue policy from the fiscal policy? Like, if you go back to Chile, it's not that the profits from copper uh, were Chile's government to stash away. Profits belong to the companies that were exporting uh, copper, right? It was Chile's choice uh, to spend less than its revenue, which comes from taxes and other things, and to keep that in the form of international reserves. Right? So um, basically, they were being <coughs> frugal when, with their um, fiscal policy, right? 
and uh, what they were able to say, they were stashing away in, in American dollars. It's more complex than this because the COPA revenue is de facto the act of taxing the revenue of uh, some of the multinationals that are uh, selling co Chilean copper and also a, a part of the copper is produced by a, a government owned company in Chile. So the bottom line, uh, most of this revenue was managed uh, in the form of a copper fund and this revenue was directly the outcome of copper. And then the question is, and this is a tough one, after all this revenue is supposed to support fiscal policy. But would you like to follow the example of my state, California, that when the good news of the boom of the Silicon Valley in the 90s hit California, the political system assumed de facto that this is a permanent boom. Expanding all the expenditure, and you know, always there are great projects waiting around, but we know that in 2001 we observed the past. And then California is ending up now in the position of Argentina of not being able to support itself in a recession. Now, of course, this is a more complex situation because still California is paying most of the taxes to DC, as my governor hopes that maybe there will be bailouts from DC. Chile don't have such a mechanism. So that, uh, at the end of the day, you are right that in terms of net present value, this copper money will support fiscal policy. But the question is, would I like to spend most of this, of this revenue in good years or in bad years? And the choice of Valesco was correct, in my view. Good times of copper money and oil money are temporary. It's hard to know when there will be the unwinding, but it's not too hard to come with a formula, and I'm managing this money using a formula that I can discuss. And then the idea is that if you believe that uh, you are living in good times, channel a fraction, say, 40% or 50% of the copper revenue to a copper fund, and bad times spend it. Yeah, that, that's precisely my point. What's commendable here is the decision to, of the Chilean government to save money. Right? Yeah. But that's a separate decision from that of how am I going to keep those savings? I'm, am I going to keep them in some international reserves, uh, in foreign banks, or am I going to use that money, for instance, to buy debt back and reduce the size of public debt? That, that, that was my, my point. Those okay, uh, I understand. So, but then you should distinguish between buying part of your foreign debt versus part of the domestic debt. And the main idea is that you would like to find a way to increase the net foreign asset position of the country, and either one of the two ways will do. So you are right that in principle one can also reduce the external debt of Chile, and this was done partially. But you don't want to, out to spend all the copper money on reducing your, your external debt, because then you are facing the trap that we have seen the crisis, I discussed the case of Korea, that for countries that didn't have enough reserves during the crisis, it was impossible practically to borrow hard currency to meet their needs. So you're right, that this is a, a part, part of the challenge of managing properly external debt and reserves, but any corner solution will backfire if a country is facing a massive crisis that this time was propagated from the US and indirectly from Europe. So your point is valid. Having said that, if you look at the history of Chile in the last five to ten years, uh, on balance I think that they did an uh, excellent job in trying to balance all these uh, competing challenges. And what is remarkable is that the political system at the end tolerated this pattern and now everybody recognizes that he was right on the money. Okay. Other questions? So, uh, I would like to uh, review briefly the results. The recent crisis illustrated that accumulation of reserves, what we call hoarding reserves, is a potent but limited self-insurance mechanism. So this is a way that countries will attempt to self-insure themselves against bad things that may happen, either due to the collapse of the price of copper 
or oil, or maybe due to capital flight if the country is integrated with the capital market, and I'll review several of these options. Yet, I'll argue that holding reserves is expensive and less efficient in the absence of assertive external debt management policies. And I'll describe briefly these policies at the end of the talk, if time will allow. Now, unregulated external borrowing of the type that I'll argue Korea exhibited before the crisis leads to inefficient outcome. And I'll spend maybe 20 minutes explaining the recent history of Korea. And I argue that what we call externalities, hopefully all of you are aware of this, if not I can discuss what do we mean by externalities. Have you heard about the concept of congestion externalities? Or you are living in a place that is not suffering from congestion, but if you recall <laughs> driving uh, to the airport in uh, Canada or whatever, congestion externalities is a buzzword for the possibility that when you are driving to the airport, you're looking at the time for you from here to the airport or from Manhattan to Kennedy Airport as the your cost of time cost of going to the airport, but you are ignoring the fact that when you are entering the highway, you are increasing maybe by five seconds my time of hitting the airport if I'm competing with you on the space of the highway. And this five seconds is the externality. Five seconds may be small, but if maybe 20,000 New Yorkers are trying to reach Kennedy Airport, multiply the, the five cents by 20,000, and we are getting a big externality. I would like to argue that this type of congestion externality is a good reason to regulate inflows of capital, and this is partially what Brazil, India, China, and other countries are trying to do and to follow this policy. So this is a more technical aspect. I promise not to show you more than one equation, but uh, I can uh, explain the logic of this uh, argument uh, in the second uh, uh, half of the uh, seminar. And the optimal policies for a country like Korea or Chile is, I believe, taxing external borrowing, which de facto is done in hard currency, because Chile cannot borrow in, in terms of its own currency, unlike the US, that so far we have the luxury the privilege that we seem to abuse of borrowing in terms of our domestic dollar. This is not the case of practically 95% of developing countries, and I'm sure that Barry Eichengreen will talk about this more <laughs> in more details. Now, hoarding, one can use this policy of taxing inflow of capital to subsidize the accumulation of reserves. Because one criticism that may be related to your question is, that reserves frequently is a boring asset that is yielding by now maybe 2 or 3 percent if the reserves are in US dollar, which seems to be the choice of roughly 70 to 65 percent of all the countries, or in terms of the stock of reserves. And uh, there is a reason maybe to subsidize public reserves by taxing the activities that are exposing the economy in the first place to the need to self insure against some bad external or internal events. And the side benefit that such a scheme may mitigate the political demand in emerging markets, including Chile, to spend the reserves, because we are talking about poor countries. And then if you hear that the governor is sitting on a pile of $40 billion that is invested in New York or in Switzerland, and if you are suspicious about the party that is running the central bank and the treasury, so then you have a valid concern. Okay, so this is part of the conundrum facing a lot of these countries. So let me turn to the history of reserves. And what you see here is the ratio of reserves to GDP from 80 to 2006 before the crisis. Now, the blue curve are the OECD industrial countries. And nothing is happening there. It's practically flat. At, uh, at a level of 3 to 4 percent. Nothing is happening. The big story is the red curve, reflecting the average of developing countries. This is 5 percent, <coughs> above but uh, not dramatically the level of industrial countries. Notice that in a window of 25 years, it quantiplied to more than 25 percent. 
And that's weird because if you are running this graph to the back, going back to 1945, nothing interesting happened to this red curve. The takeoff happened around this area. Now, the other curves are disaggregating this red curve. And if you are looking at this curve, it focuses on Asia excluding China. China is unique in everything, including in the behavior of reserves. This curve, the yellow, reflects China. It was practically reasonably flat until 92. There was a small jump, and during this window, which was the area of the Asian crisis of 97, it was stable with some marginal decline. And then something remarkable has happened from 2000 to 2001. Reserves of China that at that time were about 14% jumped in a window of about nine years to 50% of the Chinese GDP. Uh, this is unprecedented experience in the history, and I don't have the time to discuss too much that part, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. The point that I'd like to make is that the takeoff of the reserves of developing countries started in earnest in the 90s. Now, <coughs> it continued more aggressively <coughs> in the 2000s, but this part was dominated really by the adjustment to the crisis of 97. This is the time. 97 was the time where Korea, Thailand, and other countries in the region went through what is called, we call, sudden stop crisis. Now, this surprised practically everybody, because if you look at these countries, they used to run balanced fiscal policy. Their growth rate was high, and nobody treated them as banana republics in Latin America. There's nothing wrong with Latin America, but the pres presumption was that these type of events are hitting periodically Latin America, not East Asia. So it was a major surprise. And notice that following this surprise, we observed a major increase in reserves. It started in Asia minus China. In 2001, China joined the trend. And by now, China is somewhere there, 50%. So this is the background of what's going on. <coughs> Now, uh, the interpretation. Josh? Yes. The very, very quick uh, sure. question. Did the session of China into the WTO, did that have any change or uh, came with conditions on their reserve holdings? No. Uh, the, the, this, the behavior of reserves of China is debatable. Okay. My own take on this is that. This period is the time where China decided not to follow the devaluations of Korea and other countries in the region, allowing them to recover. This was the time that also the Chinese growth rate seemed to decline. And something happened, I don't know exactly what one can speculate. In 2001, 2002, there was apparently a regime change, shift there. And it's more complex, it's not only reserves. I believe that there is a lot of attempts to subsidize the cost of capital in China, in the state enterprise, and beyond this. Now, Korea and Japan followed similar policy, but China added a very aggressive policy of accumulation of reserves, which is part of a more complex policy. And for sure, uh, in the next quarters, we'll hear this policy being debated in Washington and between Washington and Beijing. So I don't want to spend too much time on China because uh, it's more a unique uh, experiment that uh, uh, we can discuss more, but my focus will be on all emerging markets short of China. Having said that, I have some views about the debate uh, dealing with China and the US, so I'd be happy to uh, discuss this as well. But I don't think that this is related to the WTO. It's more related to uh, what I believe is a one-sided financial integration of China. If you are a Chinese citizen, it's very hard for you to buy foreign assets, such that 90% of 
Chinese residents are facing rigid capital controls preventing capital outflows, but China is encouraging capital inflows and is encouraging export driven growth. The combination of all this is generating this policy and uh, I think it will be a source of a lot of friction in the next uh, several years, partially because of the crisis which everything is related to everything according to some the large accumulation of reserves by China indirectly is one of the factors that contributed to the onset of the forces I believe that generated the growing exposure of the US to the crisis not because of China, because of our mistakes but this is a different story okay? other questions so the, the idea of uh, trying to explain why reserves increased within a window of 20, 25 years by a factor of five, that's a challenge because we are talking about poor to very poor countries. China, even today, is a very poor country. Korea is not as poor as Korea used to be, but still it's not as wealthy a country as Japan or the US. And if you look at other countries, including Chile, we are talking about countries that are growing, but still they are characterized by significant incidence of poverty within the country. And why these countries should buy foreign assets? Some of this is called a paradox where the poor is financing the rich, because when these countries are buying U.S. government bonds, they are financing collectively all of us in the U.S. Now, the uh, one interpretation is that prior to the financial integration that happened in earnest in the 90s, all these countries were not integrated with the global financial system, so the only reason to hold reserves was to cover the volatility generated by instability of trade trade of goods and services. Now, all this change were in the 90s, due to reasons that we can discuss, and you'll hear this maybe more from Joe Stiglitz, I don't have the time, but in the 90s, more and more countries adopted the Washington Consensus that financial liberalization is great for your mental health. Well, <laughs> Korea followed this in 92, and they noted in 97 that this was not the case, and they went through a massive crisis. What surprised most of us is that after 97, instead of going back and shutting themselves to a degree to inflow of capital, they went all the, way, all the way and opened themselves entirely, which in my view is a mistake and I'll discuss it shortly. But once that you are opening yourself to volatile financial flows, you are exposing yourself to much greater volatility and risks. Now, when a crisis is hitting you, nobody would like to extend your credit. If the crisis is too costly, the only mechanism for you to insure yourself is self-insurance. And this is the lesson of Korea. And Korea was the first, I believe, that adjusted, and I'll show the, the, the data of Korea shortly, and other countries follow the example of Korea. So this is one interpretation. It's not the only one. Calvo and Reinhardt. Calvo is a, a very influential, a first-rate economist that is now at Columbia, and according to some, he is the best uh, Latin American economist that, uh, of course, is living in the U.S. for the last 30 years after earning his PhD, I believe, from Yale. But he uh, he pushed with uh, uh, Calvo and Reinhardt the idea that developing countries are characterized by the fear of floating. The desire to tightly manage the exchange rate or to keep fixing it. And the logic is that exchange volatility will tend to increase the cost of trade. These countries don't have enough markets that will allow exporters and importers to hedge against this exposure. Hence, it's useful for the central bank to reduce the volatility of the exchange rate. Also, to mitigate destabilizing balance sheet shocks in the presence of dollarized liability. So this is a fancy name to something quite simple. If Argentina borrowed in the 90s in terms of dollar, which was the case, was the case, 
then the cost of servicing the debt is in terms of dollar. Now, if because of the fiasco of the policies in Argentina, they are forced to devalue by, say, 200%, which happened in 2001, let me skip the history that led to this, this implies that in the short run, the dollar cost of servicing the debt is increasing by a factor of 150% or more. And if this is happening in the background of a recession, then the country frequently is unable to service the debt. In the case of Argentina, they defaulted on close to $100 billion. It's, the reasons for this include what I'm referring to as the balance sheet effect. If you don't like this, then you should follow the policy of Brazil that traditionally, during that time, attempted to mitigate the net exposure such that for short-term borrowing in dollar, they attempted to increase their liquidity in terms of reserves to have almost a perfect match, and I'll show this policy later within 20 minutes. So this is the logic behind the policy of Brazil that did it under reasonably flexible exchange rate. Now, if you don't like the valuation, so then you are trying to fix the exchange rate. The fear of floating is the fear that any devaluation will increase the cost of servicing external debt and may lead to recessions and unemployment. But then, to manage a fixed exchange rate, especially if you are increasing your integration in the financial market, you should hold a lot of reserves. And uh, for some countries, like, say, Argentina in the early 90s, the idea of fixing a peso to the dollar was a way of trying to break the inflationary cycle that characterized Argentina and also Brazil in the 80s. And finally, the, this is the self-insurance against capital flight and sudden stops of inflows of capital. And at the bottom, this is the most debatable aspect that I, I don't want to discuss today, there is a chance that China is following a mercantilist policy where holding reserves is delivering all these services. On the top of this, it may increase competitiveness of China relative, say, to Korea and other countries that are not following this policy. So let me skip this part. I'm mentioning this for, to cover all the options. Now, here you see a, a quick summary of the history of financial integration. Now, this chart is a measure of capital account utilization index using the famous index by Chin Ito. I think that in the test you ask who is Chin and who is Ito. But the bottom line is that this is a useful index. Here we normalize this. This is a joint paper with uh, Jay Woolley from the IMF. We normalize this index to be 1 in 1980. And this is the index for developing countries. Notice the takeoff of financial integration in the 90s. We don't observe any uh, major takeoff of financial integration of the OECD countries. They did most of the integration before. And notice that at the top, this curve is reserved to GDP of the rich countries, it's reasonably flat. The takeoff of reserves to the GDP by developing countries happened almost exactly around the time of the takeoff of financial integration. So this is the, uh, our interpretation for the forces that started the rush to hold reserves. Once that these countries gave up to Washington consensus, they opened their financial system. It took a crisis of 97 to convince Korea, but this was not the first crisis. If you recall, there was a te tequila crisis. Mexico went through almost identical crisis in 94, precisely around the time where they opened their financial system. Now, of course, everybody believed that Korea is not Mexico, so and Korea believed this to be the case. And indeed, the saving rate of Korea is twice or triple the saving rate of Mexico. But still, they went through exactly the same crisis. Okay, so never say never. And now the US went through another sudden stop instrumented eternally. So all of us are susceptible to crisis, even the US, or especially the US. But let me not talk about this. 
So let me turn now to what's happened in the latest crisis. What is interesting is that if you are convinced by the argument of Karl Boyd Reinhardt of the fear of floating, so then you should expect that countries that are going through the massive recession and the instability propagated from the US this time, in 2008, from 2008, we tend to use reserves. So in a recent study with ESAN, we looked at the actual record of using reserves during the crisis. And these charts are focusing on 21 emerging markets, covering most of the emerging markets that we had data. And we are normalizing the charts such that one is the peak of reserves in this window. And let me skip the details, but it turned out that to our surprise, only half of the emerging markets use the reserves beyond 10%. The remaining either didn't use reserves, some even increased the reserves throughout the crisis. And this is the case of uh, China, where is uh, China is uh, here. This is China, Chile used some of it, but uh, not uh, by a big, uh, by significant extent. So this by itself is a puzzle, for us at least, and let me run through several examples. Brazil and Turkey uh, used during the crisis only 10% of the reserves. Brazil preferred to go through a massive swing of its exchange rate to the tune of 40%. So, for us, this indicates that at least for half of the countries, during the crisis, we don't detect any fear of floating. If there is a fear, it's the fear of losing too rapidly the reserves. So, this is an interesting question, I'm trying to explain why. Now, Korea lost 25% and Korea is interesting because everybody in Korea started believing that they are going to relieve the 97 crisis and then something interesting happened that I'll discuss shortly. Russia went through a massive potential meltdown. They used about the third of their reserves and they imposed significant capital controls, de facto capital controls to help them dealing with this and Poland used roughly 30%. So um, the way to, to the, looking at the data, we tested this and we concluded that at least for half of the countries, during what we call the flight to quality and deleveraging during the first phase of the crisis, the adjustment of emerging markets was constrained more by the, the fear of losing reserves than by the fear of floating. Now, let me explain what we do mean by flight to quality and deleveraging. So let me give you a simple example. If you look at Korea, before 97, not more than 5% of the Korean stock market was owned by foreigners. After 97, to the surprise of some, including to my surprise, they opened entirely the stock market. At the peak, more than a third of the entire Korean stock market was owned by foreign parties, a lot of hedge funds, pension funds in the US, Europe, and the like. But this is remarkable because uh, I cannot think about any significant country of the size of Korea where more than a third of its assets are held by foreigners. I'm sure that if a third of the assets of uh, the US would be held by foreigners, Politically, we'll be unhappy about this. We have seen some of this in the context of sovereign wealth funds, but let's skip this one. Now, what we refer to the flight to quality is that if my hedge fund in the US is facing liquidity shortage because of the events of 2008-9, and if my hedge fund invested in Korea, the flight to quality implies that they will try to sell their Korean assets in order to gain dollar liquidity. So this is what we call flight quality and deleveraging, which implies really that whoever that invested in emerging markets, including Korea, Brazil, Chile, and the like, there was tremendous liquidity crunch in the US, and all these parties, pension funds, hedge funds, investment banks, and the like, attempted to sell in a rush any foreign assets that they were able to liquidate to gain domestic liquidity. 
Uh, this imposed tremendous pressure on Korean reserves. At the same time, the trade of Korea collapsed. I didn't skip the test, but Korea is a dynamic exporter. Nobody, because of the disappearance of financial markets, there was no way to finance exports, and the exports of Korea crashed, and also the demand for their exports crashed. So this led to the use, initial use of reserves by Korea, but then the authorities noted that they are losing reserves, but still the pressure of deleveraging and the disappearance of exports continue. And my interpretation is that they decided maybe to refrain from depleting too fast the reserves because of the uncertainty regarding the duration of the crisis. So uncertainty regarding crisis duration and the debt seem to explain partially the reluctance of countries to use their reserves. So this is one possible interpretation. Of course, this raises the question, if that's the case, so maybe to start with, you accumulated too much reserves, and then you are not willing to use them. So there is a paradox here, which I'll discuss shortly in terms of the political implications. But the bottom line, only half of the emerging markets used and relied on depleting their part of the reserves throughout the adjustment, and they put greater part of the adjustment into the depreciation of their exchange rate. Now, uh, looking more uh, carefully, we found that uh, trade factors like trade openness and the like seem to be much seem to be much more significant in accounting for the pre-crisis demand for reserves by the countries that actually used reserves. The other countries apparently didn't work before the crisis. Didn't try to accumulate reserves due to trade factors. It was more maybe financial exposure that mot motivated them to accumulate. So let me skip this uh, uh, episode by summarizing this, referring to five countries. Russia is at the bottom. One is indexed to the level of reserves at the beginning of the crisis. And notice that in the first phase of the crisis, they were willing to use more than a third of the reserves. Then they stopped. Why? You are afraid that if you are losing too much, then you may encourage a run on your reserves because then everybody say, gee, Russia is going under. Let me sell all my Russian assets before the country will collapse. And then you are afraid that if you are depleting reserves too fast and if you don't know what is the duration of the crisis, then maybe the worst part of the crisis will hit you without reserves. Of course, this raises again the question, the degree to which the logic behind the accumulation of reserves is passing the test of cost-benefit if during the crisis we are afraid of losing the reserves. Because maybe to start with, you didn't manage well your external exposure. And I'll return to this issue shortly. A quick question. Sure. So Russia decided not to use its reserves anymore. So what was the option? What did they do then to uh, go with the capital flight? Okay, first they used uh, close to 40% of the reserves. So they used the reserves massively. Now what happened then is that they decided, gee, tough time, let us impose capital controls. So de facto, they moved into the mode of imposing capital, capital controls. Some of this was done through in a, unofficial channels. So Russia by now is far from being a, a free market system. And the Kremlin, in my view at least, has enough leverage to signal to banks, don't engage in capital flight. Otherwise, you know, after the crisis, you'll see. Okay? <laughs> this is one, my interpretation of signals from the Kremlin. Uh, we shouldn't uh, laugh at uh, the Kremlin because if you have the policy of the Fed, the New York Fed, under Geithner during the crisis, they <laughs> provided their own signal to AIG. So it's much more complex. I don't envy being uh, in the position of Geithner or the governor of the Central Bank of Russia during the crisis because in the US at least we can print the dollar which is the source of global liquidity. The Kremlin <laughs> cannot view the ruble as international currency. So I think that this episode 
happened at the background of first using roughly 36% of their reserves to cover the first run on their currency, the first round of deleveraging. Then, this was the stage that, by luck, the wars of the crisis seem to ease, but then they also gave enough signal that eased some of the capital flight. Okay, but again, this is quite an extreme case. Korea, which is uh, uh, here, is a more complex story, and I refer to this shortly, but this inverted S-curve is consistent with the idea that in the first phase, you are panicking, you are using reserves fast, but then at a certain stage you are saying, gee, at this stage, within, you know, two years I'm hitting zero. That's a bad position. So let us slow down. And you can slow down by imposing capital controls or other tricks. And let me turn now to Korea, because this is a, a country that really is leading the charge in terms of policies uh, of a... The charts here are the following. This is international reserve to GDP. It was practically zero at the time of the crisis, 97. Now the second chart, the bluish one, is <coughs> reflecting. You see, this is the short-term external debt, what we call sometimes hot money. Now notice that before the crisis, short-term external debt increased substantially. And this was partially the trigger for the crisis. Hot money refers to short-term borrowing, say, for a maturity of half a year to a year or less. And this is the total external debt as a fraction of the GDP. And notice that the story of the crisis was that Korea did manage reserves properly. They reached zero at the time where the total external debt was roughly 50% of the GDP. But Korea is a country with a high saving rate. After the crisis, let's say, gee, let us increase reserves aggressively, and within less than five years, reserves reached a level that was close to 25 to 30% around that time. And notice that around that time, the total external debt was below reserves. So Korea had the illusion that they are self-insured, because they covered all their external debt by reserves. So going back to your point at the beginning, they listened to what you said and they accumulated reserves to cover more than all their exposure. But this was not enough. And that's the interesting uh, chapter that we see here. In 2004, Korea seemed to be perfectly covered because, again, their reserve position exceeded they had enough hard currency to meet all their external debt. But something interesting happened from 2004 to 2008. They are reasonably happy with their policies, and they tolerated the behavior of the private sector that increased rapidly in four years, total external debt, way above their reserves. OK? And at the onset of the crisis, they were exposed to a degree that was not far away from the exposure in 97. Still, uh, at the beginning of the crisis, they uh, had plenty of reserves, uh, I believe something like $245 billion, but their total external debt was much higher by a factor of two. Please. Are you going to explain why they made the same mistake twice? Good question. So, what I'm telling you is my view, after chatting with some bureaucrats and the like. So, the, the big question that you're asking is, how, have, how come that in four years, they tolerated, I'm referring to the central bank and the treasury, they tolerated opening a huge exposure. If you're looking at the text of it, something that is on the papers that uh, I send you, but I can give you more references. This was generated by three types of factors. First, this was the time of carry trade, and a lot of uh, uh, parties located in Korea decided to borrow, <laughs> to use Korea as a platform for carry trade. And this by itself increased the external debt of Korea. Okay? 
Uh, I don't have the time to review precisely what is carry trade, so if uh, some of you have not heard about this. This is a financial transaction where countries, or hedge funds if you wish, investment banks, and also US and international banks that had branches in Seoul, mostly, borrow <coughs> and use this to finance financial arbitrage, transaction, financial transactions, that at the end increased remarkably the exposure of Korea to external debt. Another part of this was that Korea cornered the market in the delivery of the most sophisticated container ships. And some of the exposure was trade related. But the back of this was more this financial arbitrage by carry trades, hedge funders and the like. Now, when I, I attempted to check with friends in the central bank there why they knew the numbers, but they preferred not to intervene, nobody forecasted the crisis of the type that happened, where Korea would be hit by deleveraging coming from the US. They also believed that you know, the investment banking community is powerful enough such that they preferred not to challenge them. So to a degree, they were under the spell of the same beliefs that we have seen in the US, that really Wall Street is regulating itself, and the political system, as far as I can read it, is afraid of Wall Street until this day. My reading is that Korea was infected by this. But this was a major shocker for them. And hopefully, you follow, the, even if you don't understand what is carry trade, hopefully you see that it was really the surprised that the crisis happened not from Korea, because they believe that they are well positioned to deal with internal instability, not with external instability. So then we observed the crisis around that period, and Korea went through a massive adjustment. They decided first to fight by throwing reserves. They spent $60 billion, 20 quarter of the reserves, but the pressure continued. And then the central bank decided to bail out the domestic banking system by a package of $100 billion. They had enough reserves and they believed that this bailout, which is covering the short-term <coughs> borrowing that was due to be recycled, they believed that it's more than enough. It turned out that it was not enough. And there were rumors that, you know, that the real reserves of Korea are much less. And the same rumors happened also in 97, that the test. But the bottom line, they noted that despite the fact that they have a lot of reserves, the pressure of deleveraging continued. And here I'm citing Young Cho Park, which is a senior advisor at the KD and an advisor to the Treasury there. And he argues that only when Korea secured a swap line of $30 billion from the Fed, and I'll explain this shortly, only then if you wish, this swap line bailed out Korea. Now, this is a really remarkable because, as you stated, in a way, Korea relived another version of a crisis that surprised it. Of course, the present crisis differs from 97, but the bottom line is, from 97, they listened to the most conservative Washington consensus. They followed it from A to Z, and now they are exposed again. Which leads me to the last part of the uh, discussion, where I review quickly the lessons that I think Korea should infer. It's a paper that, by chance, was commissioned by the Central Bank of Korea. So, uh, <laughs> but I'm, uh, I wrote a, a similar paper ten years ago. So at least you cannot blame me that I wrote this for Korea <laughs> audience. But uh, uh, my my view, going back to, if you wish, to this episode, my view about this is that the Korean authorities were sleeping during that period, due to reasons that I alluded, and they had and had enough instruments to try to deal, to deal with this. In the same way, I think that the Fed was sleeping uh, in the US uh, at the time that we generated internally similar exposure with all the differences that we can print the dollar, something that Koreans legally cannot do. So uh, let me explain the story of the swap lines. What you see here is all the swap lines that the Fed initiated in the context of the crisis. Now, a swap line, if you wish, is 
a borrowing or a credit line initiated by between the Fed and other central banks. Now, the swap line frequently is for a given duration, and the idea is that, say, what you'll see this in the reddish part, the red columns are the initial swap lines. Let me focus on the ECB. This is the European Central Bank. The beginning of the crisis generated tremendous demand for dollar liquidity, globally, and also in the US. Legally, the US Fed is the only body that can print legally the money. So the way to think about this, this is dollar credit line that was extended by the Fed to the European Central Bank. Now, this is a common practice. This is not a surprise. But notice that this was huge. It was close to 270 billion. Now, this is part of the complex ex exposure of AIG and other monkeys that I don't have the time to discuss now, and <laughs> some views that I don't have the time now to air. <laughs> but let me skip this, but uh, you can find uh, my views in some of my articles. But the bottom line, the big surprise, this is Japan, by the way, the UK, Sweden. But this is not new stuff. The new stuff is that for the first time, the Fed extended four swap lines to emerging markets. And these are the four emerging markets. Now, you don't see this. This is Brazil. That what you see here is that they didn't use the swap lines. So these columns, if you're looking at the timeline, is here, reflects the degree to which the block, this is the European Central Bank, represent the block of the core of Europe, and other countries use it. So Brazil got 30 billion, Korea got 30 billion, and they used part of this to stabilize the system. Mexico used some of this, not as much as Korea, and Singapore. So what is interesting is that the Fed decided to bail out what some argue, to bail out not only AIG, but also to bail out Korea. Now, uh, this is interesting because uh, you can ask, gee, why the taxpayer in the US is bailing out Korea? I turn out, if you're at the text of it, frequently when the Fed is bailing out somebody, they are bailing out not the direct party, but maybe the party in the US that is exposed to Korea. It turned out that not bailing out Korea would have been a policy that a dad would penalize a lot of the hedge funds in the US. They were exposed to Korea and pension funds and the like. And Korea is a safe bet because with probably 100%, if you said Korea and you met South Korea, not North Korea, and you met with the bureaucrats, their saving rate is 30, 35%. They pay back up to the last dime. You recall, by the way, a similar policy of a U.S. bailout of a country, which was not exactly a swap line, but it was a similar policy that initially the U.S. was heavily, or the Treasury that did it was heavily criticized, and then it turned out to be a great policy for the U.S. And it, yes, yes, it happened in the last 25, 30 years or less. Well, uh, if you recall, there was a te tequila crisis in '94. Who was the treasurer at that time? Really? It was Rubin and then Larry Summers. It turned out that at that time, not bailing out Mexico during the tequila crisis would have penalized my pension fund, which at that time was the aircraft. I don't know if you are under this system, but this is only one example where a lot of the money that poured to Mexico following opening Mexico to financial flows was really pension funds and investment banking from the US. So ultimately, Larry Summers orchestrated through North Swap Lines for the World Bank and the IMF a bailout, not of Mexico, but of my pension fund. And it turned out that it was a brilliant step because <laughs> Mexico paid up to the last dime all the bailout. So it turned out the bailout was a great deal for my pension fund. They invested in Mexico because what is called the Teso Bono, oh, bonus offered at that time interest rate in dollar of 10% at the time that the interest rate in the U.S. was, if you wish, 5 or 6%. It was probably Larry Summers' uh, pension also. <laughs> <laughs> at that time, but later he got a nice uh, endowment, I think, from a certain hedge fund. Let's give later as well. Yeah, right, at that time. 
But it goes back to the uh, complex issue that when there is a bailout, uh, ask who is the ultimate party that is benefiting. Please. Yeah, recently, um, there have been reports in Europe that uh, some of the smaller European countries, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, have severe liquidity crisis. Uh, do you care to comment on who would bail them out? The European sure. Central Bank or, or could you sure. say something about uh, the situation? I would be surprised if the uh, bulk of the bailout would be done by Europe. Uh -huh. And it, it would be done, uh, a lot of this would be done by uh, the European Central Bank. Some of this may be done through the IMF or the ECB, the European Central Bank, will give some credit to the IMF to impose conditions on Greece. I wouldn't be surprised if at the end of the day it would be something that if it would be managed properly by Europe, it would be like, like Mexico, uh -huh. forcing Greece to go through a massive fiscal adjustment because these countries, that, uh, most of them are uh, around uh, southern uh, Europe, uh, are not following uh, prudent fiscal policies and uh, now it's uh, the problem of Europe. They're not commodity countries though, so why did they get into such bad trouble in the first place. Well, where, where well you can ask the same about California. California is not a commodity state. We used to sell uh, uh, IT blueprints of uh, Apple and the like. And the answer is, if you are following populist policy, in good times, you are overspending, because good times, then your horizon is four years. That's my interpretation of some of the governors in California and in uh, Europe, and in Latin America, and even the US. So if you your horizon is short enough, and if the voter is not enforcing you to recognize that the horizon of, of the voter is supposed to be more than four years, then you are trapped, because then in good times you overspend, you borrow, in bad times you default like Argentina, mm -hmm. if you are part of the ECB, so then uh, you have a problem, because you can ask in the short term a bailout by the ECB, because they are afraid the ACB is afraid now of this boomerang effect, but then don't be surprised that after the bailout will have tough conditionality imposed on you. But uh, this is the good scenario. The best scenario is uh, that maybe it will not, maybe this crisis will go beyond Greece and will infect other countries. I I'm still cautiously optimistic that the ACB will do what it takes, but uh, it will be a massive coordination beyond the ACB because it's really a massive political decision. Yes? What do you think about the euro? Is the euro going to be, is it in danger for those prices? Well, Since, you know, I can tell you the following. The history of the euro uh, uh, is fascinating to me at least. Most of the economists in the US believe that the euro will not fly from the beginning. That it wasn't a good idea and that uh, it generated a lot of instability. This crisis is the first test of the euro project. Now, look at the US. The dollar is supposed to be a strong currency. But we have a union of 200 years. And my fuzzy recollection is that in the first 50 years of the union, we were, it was a massive civil war. And there was also a lot of instability of the dollar at the beginning of the uh, US as a state. So my, my sense is Europe is trying to condense a lot of the history of the US that took 200 years to bring us to whatever that we see now, which again is debatable to what degree we should be only delighted with whatever we see now. So my sense, this is the first serious test of the uh, uh, Euro bloc. I think that the vested interest uh, of the core of Europe, i.e. Germany and France as such, that the weight of all the periphery the countries that are exposed is not large enough. Yeah. Greece makes only 2.5% of... Yeah, so, so my sense, you know, they, they will bail out. My, my guess, it would be messy and nasty. Had they been in the position of uh, deciding what to do, I will give the IMF $100 billion, and I'll ask the IMF to go to these countries and to impose strict conditionality. This was done partially in bailing out some of the countries in Eastern Europe, partially. Um, you know, this is the best scenario that I can. And the IMF is in the position of doing it, especially because the IMF is managed traditionally by a European person, which by now is Mr. Strauss, which was the finance minister of France. He is a smart fellow, and he, he understands what, what he takes. So I think that there may be a period where there will be 
panic of the financial system, and I think that the dollar may strengthen because of this, but uh, in my view, within half a year, uh, it hopefully it will be over, otherwise, you know, all bets are off. But well, a lot of this is related also to the global evolution of the crisis globally, including the emerging markets in Europe. After all, Germany is doing very well exporting to emerging markets. Uh, Germany is doing in terms of the uh, exports much better than us, despite the fact that they are pricing their product in euro, which is reasonably strong relative to the dollar. Okay? So the point that I would like to make here is that it was really a decision by the Fed to bail out the four emerging markets, exactly these four, because these are the countries that bailing out the, was in the direct economic and political interests of the US. Now, I have uh, not more than 15 minutes, so let me tell you what is my take about this. Am I right that we are done at 3.30? <clears throat> so let me contrast Brazil to Korea. Korea is performing very well. It's not the best performer by now in uh, East Asia because China is growing at a faster rate. But if you are looking at the history of Korea from 1968, it's a great success story. In 1968, Korea was at the level of poverty of Bangladesh. By now, we are visiting Seoul. To my taste, a lot of the parts of Seoul are better integrated with the internet than uh, Manhattan and other parts of the US. But let me skip it, this part. So, the context of Korea and Brazil is interesting because Brazil is by now the best performing country in Latin America. Now, what you see here is a measure of <coughs> net external debt of Brazil versus Korea. Net external debt goes back to your first question. It's a proxy of external debt minus international reserves. Now, notice the following. Around 2002, Brazil was exposed with net external debt of 35%. Korea was in a good shape, minus 5%. Around that time, there was a decision, I believe in Brazil, to manage assertively external debt by accumulation of reserves and by trying to trim external debt. And around the crisis, if you are looking at, oops, I'm sorry, Around the crisis, the net exposure of Korea was close to zero. The case of Korea was they mismanaged, they reached an exposure of roughly 20% of the GDP around the crisis. So my take from this is that emerging markets, even if they are integrated with the capital markets, have a choice, first, of reducing the integration. Secondly, even with the given integration, they can impose at the margin policies that will manage their exposure. The mistake of Korea is that they believe that they are fine. They have not anticipated the crisis coming from the US. Brazil did better. Part of this is related to the history. Brazil was managed by several governors that used to, one of them, <coughs> Arminia Fraga, was <laughs> an operator in the hedge fund in the US by Mr. Seros. So he, he understands what is uh, the challenge facing Brazil. And he adapted, when he was governor of Brazil, policies that focused quite heavily on the net foreign asset position, position of Brazil. So I'm not surprised that they uh, decided to follow these policies properly. The bottom line, Brazil used only 10% of reserves they did uh, obtain the, uh, the swap line, but they didn't touch the swap line, because swap line is a credit line that you can use or ignore. They ignored it. But of course, having the swap line helped them, because this is a signal of the commitment of the US to Brazil. Korea used quarter of reserves, and according to the interpretation of Koreans, it was only the swap line that prevented Korea from going under through another crisis. Yeah, let me just mention that that inflection point there in Brazil, 2002, Actually, when Armin Fraga was leaving the government, the Lula, the Lula administration took power. So, sure. uh, I think this has what happened to net foreign debt in Brazil has more to do with uh, uh, fiscal policies, uh, the institutions that were built during that period, and that that kind of behavior started to pay off 
have to 2000. You are right. On the other hand, the tenure of uh, Armenian Fraga and all the bureaucrats, te technocrats around him, which is really the collective memory of the central bank, is such that in Brazil you have enough top bureaucrats that understand how to tinker with capital flows. Now, you are right that a lot of the improvement was propagated by developments that came from the Treasury and administration. On the other hand, if the need to arise, Brazil has a history of proactive policy of managing its external debt. Korea, from 19, uh, practically from the early 90s, don't have a good record of history of trying to manage external debt. And now they are rethinking how to uh, learn from the experience of other countries, including Brazil, India, and China. I have 10 minutes, so it, technically you are right, but the point is, Arminio Fraga is only one name. Central bank and the treasury are run by maybe several, uh, maybe 100, 200 technocrats. And the question is to what degree they have the experience in the past, or they are aware of experience of other countries that follow the policies that we have seen now in India, China, and the like. And I'll discuss it uh, shortly in the remaining 10 minutes. So uh, let me point out that both countries, uh, Brazil and Korea, went through a massive uh, exchange depreciation. But if your net external debt is close to zero, a depreciation will have small effects on you, which has been the case of <coughs> Brazil. The same depreciation had much more traumatic effect on Korea. And luckily, as I mentioned before, Korea got the swap line preventing it from going through a massive recession of the type that they went through in 97, 98. So, uh, let me uh, point out that this is really, in my view, the global crisis of the last two years is the first serious test of modern financial globalization. And the outcome is mixed, murky, and the old order is broken. And one of the fallouts is that financial markets integration of emerging markets will be modified. We observe the diffusion of soft capital controls, space of quasi-sovereign defaults with modeling through bailouts. And the question about Greece is only one example of some of the evolution that indirectly was propagated by the crisis. Going back to Greece, it turned out that their accounting were fuzzy. But a crisis is precisely the time that they are forcing AIG and the Treasury of various countries to open their books. And then sometimes you have nasty surprises. We are totally surprised by AIG. The ECB is totally surprised by the exposure of some of the countries in the periphery, but we are not doing much better than them. The main difference is that we can print the dollar so far. <laughs> Even this may change. But, so, uh, I believe that there is room to revisit the entire financial architecture of looking at the patterns of global regulations. I don't have the time to talk about this, but so far the changes are timid. Hence, there is no reason to believe, on behalf of emerging markets, that they, are not that they will not be exposed to similar financial volatility. And the proper management of debt remains a key challenge facing developing countries. Now, soft capital controls properly implemented may facilitate a more sustainable financial integration, and this, in a way, is a second best adjustment in the absence of better global regulations of financial flows, something that, until further notice, I don't expect to happen. And let me point out that this is not new observation. The fastest growing emerging markets in Asia, China, India, and Latin America, i.e. Brazil, are restricting the flows of funds, policies that implicitly subsidize the cost of large accumulation of reserves. Now, th these policies, reduce the exposure of China and India, and indirectly in Brazil, to a lot of the pressure generated by the crisis. And <coughs> at the end of the paper, I'm uh, putting a model. Let me tell you the main essence of the model. It's really a model for externalities, but it goes back to optimal insurance. With hazards that are impacted by my behavior, the insurance company that is insuring me, frequently, when they are selling me the insurance company, 
they are adding some if you wish items to the insurance policy by giving me a discount if I'm driving a safer car or maybe encourage me to install a fire alarm, external lights and the like. So in this context, holding reserves and holding self-insurance is the insurance policy that the country is generating by accumulating liquidity. But one can do better by also <coughs> managing external exposure. And in order to do this, I'm showing the model that this implies precisely a combination of two policies, and these policies were alluded before by various people, including Roderick. The policies <coughs> are related to the fact that frequently <coughs> there are negative externalities such that when a Korea or Brazil or comparable country is going through a crisis that is forcing in a rush to sell Korean assets in order to generate the liquidity, the dollar liquidity, in this process we generate or we observe what is called fire sale externalities. Now the best example of fire sale externality is say California, if you are visiting Stockton, <laughs> two thirds of the real estate there is foreclosed. Okay? Now if I am living in Stockton, this by itself is generating tremendous negative externality on me because another house that is facing foreclosure is first reducing the value of my house. Then it reduces the tax base. It reduces the quality of the services that I'm getting, being education, being police. And this is something that is not internalized by the fellow that decided to walk away from his or her mortgage. So this is a good example for me of fire cell externality in the context of the real estate in my state. You know better about your state, but I believe that my state is doing better in the foreclosure rate, i.e. No. <laughs> yes. We are leading uh, the charge. Maybe there is some competition in Arizona, but I'm not fully updated. So the proper way of thinking about it is that Korea is facing very similar challenges during a crisis. Now, internalizing these challenges ex ante before the crisis is hitting you calls for policies that we skip the model. And <laughs> this is the story of the financial externality, which is really a financial aspect of an externality that you can see in all the Stocktons of the US today. And the idea is that each bank tends to ignore the fact that they tend to liquidate assets is going to affect all banks. And optimal policy at the end, let me skip the test, the optimal policy is a combination of taxing inflow of hot money and short-term external borrowing at a rate that may be dictated by the exposure of the economy, using this tax revenue to finance some of the accumulation of reserves. In the model I'm showing that this policy is more than revenue, revenue neutral, in the sense that the tax revenue is more than enough to fund the optimal subsidy. And I think that this is a mistake, or the absence of these policies is what exposed Korea to the possibility of reliving a crisis. And uh, this my sense is that uh, in emerging markets including Korea, there is now greater willingness to contemplate these possibilities. And I'd like to end by making the observation that I put here several um, recent news clips. The most important one here, you can see that in October 20, Brazil decided to enact the policy of a 2% financial transaction cost, uh, tax on <coughs> foreign investment flows to Brazil stock market. This tax is not, it was designed not to impact foreign direct investment, instead the tax was designed to impact more portfolio transactions. Now, the issue is not 2% or 1%. Once they are willing to impose the tax, whatever it is, 2%, maybe 15% if the need will arise. And this is not the first time that, Korea, uh, that Brazil is playing this tax. You can replicate comparable tax, not by, in this way, 
In India, this is done by changing the reserve ratio imposed on banks that are borrowing externally. So you can do a lot of this by the regulations of the central bank and not by taxing directly. So there are various ways to do it. And I think that uh, <coughs> this by itself here, you can find that has major repercussions uh, hitting Chile because it turned out that Brazil was exposed to exactly the same story that happened to Korea, that Brazil was used to finance carry trade in the context of Chile versus Brazil. So that's another aspect that I don't have the time to allude to. And here you have, and this is the last transparency that I'd like to push. This is a, a recent article from The Economist that typically is a, a liberal, if you wish, publication. Okay, this is a signal for the central plan. I should stop short <laughs> <laughs> right, This is the signal. But the bottom line, the economist is crediting India and uh, also China that their management of total management of capital flows help them in dealing with their exposure to uh, the crisis, i.e., they were the least affected countries during the crisis. Of course, the case of China is more complex because they followed really a massive fiscal stimulus, but this is part of the policies that help China in performing well throughout the crisis, unlike Korea, that by now is learning from that experience. Well, let me stop here, and thank you for your attention.